Hello everyone, Jeremy Parker here, and I wanted to make a video about this very rare and special electric piano I just finished restoring, the Rhodes Mark III EK-10. It's actually a story that starts around 1995 when I found it at a local music store not working for 125 bucks. It was in very bad shape, but somehow I thought I could bring it back to life, and it only took me 25 years to completely finish the job. Seriously though, I did get it mostly working initially. Then about five years ago, I decided to do a full restoration and fix everything. It's finally done and I am super happy with the results. But before I get into that, what the heck is this thing and what does it sound like? The Rhodes Mark III EK-10 was introduced in 1980 and at first glance looks like a Mark II 73 note piano, but was the only Rhodes to incorporate a primitive synthesizer. The late 70s and early 80s saw some of the first portable polyphonic synthesizers hitting the market and changing the sound of music during that time, so Rhodes responded. Basically, they incorporated a full polyphony synthesizer that could be mixed with the Rhodes sound in any proportion. The unique aspect of this was that the synthesizer sound was triggered by the Rhodes sound itself, not from additional key contacts or other electromechanical means. They even included a split point so that the keyboard could have two completely different sounding zones if desired. The tuning of the synthesizer was adjustable and selectable. For a given master oscillator tuning, there were three harmonic components, each an octave apart, that were activated by pressing these really cool push buttons. They turn green when you press them by a little mechanism which flips the green colored panel forward so it's visible through the little transparent window. Gosh, I love stuff like this. There were two elements, ELEC1 and ELEC2, that could access these harmonics, and you could mix and filter them in any desired way with the front panel controls. Although this was an impressive set of features for Rhodes, it lacked the powerful synthesizer controls of the day, like different waveforms, envelopes, modulation, and resonant filters with detectors. So the sound was pretty limited in timbre, and the added weight of the electronics caused the EK-10 to tip the scales at 120 pounds. I'm not sure what else they could have really done though, and unfortunately the Mark III EK-10 was not a commercial success. So you've been hearing the sound of my roads in the background, but here's a little demo of the features of this piano. First off, here's the dry roads, straight up, which I think has a great sound. I adjusted the voicing for the ideal timbre versus the shallow or deep sound. Then, here is the ELEC-1 sound by itself, which has a mellower tone, almost string-like. and the ELEC-2 sound, which is much brighter. The harmonic buttons allow you to jump up and down octaves with the synth sound or mix them all together. Then either one of the tuning knobs can be selected so you can easily switch back and forth between tunings. I like ELEC 1 for adding a pad to the road sound.
while Elect 2 can give a brighter lead sound. Oh, sorry, I couldn't help myself. If you choose the highest harmonic button with the highest unison tuning, it gives sort of an icy sound. Then of course you can tune to any arbitrary interval. Like here's a fourth above. Kind of a cool effect. Another neat feature is that there's a CV pedal input on the back for dynamically adjusting the volume of only the synth sound. Alternatively, there's a jumper setting internally that allows the synth sound only to be output from the pedal jack to allow separate processing of that sound. So that's basically what the EK-10 sounds like. Of course this was all dry, no effects or EQ, but that being said, it does sound fantastic with effects. My pedals let me get a nice Suitcase Rhodes panning effect, a stereo chorus, stereo echo, an envelope filter, or even a little crunchy distortion. But now I'll get into the history of my Rhodes and the details of its restoration, which is extensive. So get ready to geek out with me. From looking at the date code, my particular unit was probably made in October of 1980. When I got the instrument in 1995, it turned on but was not functioning, with many apparent bad connections. I slowly started making repairs to get it functioning. I found a lot of cold solder joints and eventually remade the cables connecting all the PCBs together across the top of the roads and replaced the keyboard split toggle switch. By 1999 or so, I had started to gig pretty heavily with the piano, particularly with my band at the time, the Freelance Bishops. It saw a lot of local, regional, and even national touring, and it lived a pretty hard life during this time. Here's a funny picture of my rig set up on stage right in front of Robert Walters when the Freelance Bishops were opening for him in Boston at some point in the early 2000s. Ah, good times. The road sound itself worked with some intermittent noise issues and most of the synthesizer section worked as well, although I never really used it that much. If you had seen me at a gig back then, you might have caught me banging on the lid of the roads at least once or twice during the show to stop the crackling or to get the sound to come back. Fast forward to five years ago, after I bought a Vintage Vibe Classic 73 to become my main gigging piano and finished restoring my Wurlitzer electric piano, I decided that I should do the same with my Rhodes EK-10 from the ground up. I got all my new hardware and replacement parts from Vintage Vibe, and thankfully I had found the EK-10 service manual some years ago on FenderRhodes.com. Both were great resources for this stuff and really allowed me to save the instrument, so I'll include links down in the description. Whoa, I just sounded like a real YouTuber. The first step was obviously to take everything out and strip it down to just the Tolex covered wood cabinet. The Tolex was in bad shape, torn in many places, and even the wood was showing through and splintering in areas. I had tried to repair it over the years, but it always looked pretty rough. So I removed all the old Tolex, sanded it back down to bare wood. After that, it was a series of filling and sanding with Marglass, as I knew regular wood filler would be too fragile. Instead of Tolex, I chose this textured durable paint product called Duratex, which you might find coating a PA cabinet, for example. I had used this stuff previously with good results, so I decided to go for it. I did three or four coats with the included sponge roller, and the texture came out pretty well. Putting the bling on was next, and was very satisfying. In the meantime, I had also replaced all the damper felts. The existing hammer tips were pretty worn in, so I replaced those as well. 
I even repaired one of the hammers that had a broken pivot. I also realized that the key pedestal felts had excessive friction and needed to be replaced. They are the part of the action that pushes the hammer up to strike the tine when a key is pressed. My piano tech sourced some high quality felt for me, which I used for this job. Then I remembered that one of the guide rail pins had snapped off before I ever got the piano. So one key down low always had an excessive side to side wiggle. So I drilled out the broken guide pin location, tapped the hole and rebuilt it with a screw. I shimmed it to size with some 3M 3350 tape wrapped around the screw. This 3M tape is a metallized polypropylene tape meant for wrapping ductwork, but it has a slippery surface and is quite thin and flexible. This solution worked well and the key tracked normally once again. As I put each key back in, I also shimmed the inside of the key where it sits on the balance and or guide rails with the same 3M tape to eliminate the excessive side to side play that I had always noticed with the action. In a real piano, the key bushing can be opened or closed with a tool, but that's just not possible with these plastic key sticks. The tape had a side benefit as well because it was much slipperier than the inside walls of the key sticks, and so it reduced friction. The damper pusher needed a little TLC as well, and I relined the bore of the damper pusher in the cabinet with some of the felt left over from the key pedestal job. Then it was a matter of the rest of the action going back in. Once I put the heart back in, I could start to see how the dampers would need to be adjusted. The next big job was to replace all the tone bar grommets and screws, as the old ones were a bit dried out and had lost some of their compliance. I replaced a bunch of the springs as well, and the top 10 notes also didn't have proper screws, springs, and grommets, just this rubber piece and a single screw in each tone bar. This made voicing almost impossible on these notes, so this was a good improvement to make. I had an issue with many of the new screws being wobbly, which is a long story, but eventually I got it straightened out. <laughs> Doing a full voicing, escapement, damper, and pickup adjustment was next. I did this in a few passes as one thing affects another. Generally, it's a good idea to get the voicing and escapement first as it determines the position of the time with respect to the pickup and the damper. Then the pickup position can be adjusted to even out the loudness of each note. And I definitely recommend doing this by listening to the roads over a trusted pair of headphones. Having the acoustics of a room and speaker in play is not desirable in this case as some notes will sound louder or softer to the ear than they actually are coming out of the instrument. Then finally, the dampers can be adjusted by bending them into place with just enough force to cleanly stop the note when a key is lifted, but not so much that it interferes with the normal movement of the tine during a hard key strike. The last mechanical job on the keyboard was to replace the cheek blocks, and unfortunately the new ones were not an exact drop-in replacement. They were missing this lower lip, and so I used some aluminum angle stock to recreate it. The lip slips into a slot on the inside of the cabinet in order to hold the front of the cheek block in place when the back is screwed in. Then there were the electronics, and wow, was that a job. I became more intimately familiar with the EK10 service manual than I had ever before, all 28 pages, and finally really understood how this whole thing actually works, particularly the synthesizer. I was determined to get every single synth note working, eliminate all intermittent noise, and just make it solid. So I replaced many, many op amps, ceramic caps, a few logic ICs, and all the electrolytic caps. I had found leaky electrolytic caps previously in the road, so I thought it best just to replace all of them with high quality modern caps. This wasn't just in the six detector modulator boards on the top, but also in the front panel output mixing PCB. Most of them were AC coupling caps in the signal paths, so that's pretty important for the sound of the roads and preventing any crackling or intermittent issues. 
The other upgrade I did was to replace all the op amps used in the signal summing and filtering with more modern, lower noise versions, and this helped to reduce the broadband noise. Once everything was working again and every note of the synth functioned, I could tell some of the tines in the highest couple of octaves were out of tune. So I tuned them and buttoned the whole thing up. Finally, the very last thing to be done was to refurbish the sustain pedal I had made way back in 1995, as the Rhodes didn't have the original sustain pedal when I bought it. I took it apart, drilled out the holes, and added oil light bushings and Delrin washers to minimize the friction. And finally I used the same Duratex paint to give it a more durable finish. A few pieces of the leftover red felt finished it off nicely. And so the final result is a fully functioning, cosmetically beautiful Rhodes Mark III EK-10 with equal parts perseverance and procrastination, I have once and for all finished this job. I've only seen a few of these online, but never in person, other than this one. So I think they are pretty special and worth saving if you were to ever come across one. Just don't ask me to help unless you've got 25 years to spare. But now that it's done, it will be set up here in the studio, always ready to record, and I plan to write some new music that features it along with the synth sound. And if you've made it all the way through this video, well, thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.